This is lesson eight on the fluid mechanics in medicine, and the topic is the medical applications of the Bernoulli equation. In the last lesson, we looked at two classic examples of applying the Bernoulli equation in the world of physics. In this lesson, I'll review two classic examples in the world of medicine. The first will be a qualitative example, something called the Venturi mask. Here is a cartoon representation of what a Venturi mask looks like. It is an oxygen mask, where the gray pentagon here represents the mask as it fits over a patient's mouth and nose, with a red strap going around the head to hold it in place. The two clusters of seven holes in the mask are exhalation ports, where carbon dioxide rich air expired from the patient's lungs can be released into the room. Below the mask is a vertical green tube with a trapezoid shaped hole that can be rotated to different settings, which represent the fraction of inspired air that is composed of oxygen. Standard atmospheric air is 21% oxygen. In this case, I've only shown the 28 and 35% settings, though on a typical Venturi mask, there would usually be three or four others of increasing percentages. Imagine that the plastic tube at the bottom is then hooked up to a nozzle on the hospital room wall that supplies 100% oxygen. This gas is moving quickly through the tube, so as it passes through the green compartment on the way to the mask, the high velocity results in lower than atmospheric pressure, and as a consequence, outside air is drawn into the green compartment, where it mixes with the 100% oxygen in a predictable ratio, resulting in a net oxygen concentration of 28%, which is a relatively low oxygen to air ratio. If the cone-shaped green segment is rotated to a different setting, the trapezoid hole becomes smaller, so when the oxygen rushes past, less air can be drawn inside. This results in a relatively high oxygen to air ratio within the mask. You may ask why wouldn't we want to just give pure oxygen to our sick patient? Why would we ever want to dilute the pure oxygen with relatively oxygen poor atmospheric gas? The answer is complicated and well beyond the scope of this video series, but involves a combination of the toxic generation of free radicals within the lungs by excessive oxygen and the development of something called ventilation perfusion mismatch whereby excessive inhaled oxygen tricks the body's capillaries into diverting blood flow towards regions of the lungs which are poorly functioning. I also want to point out that the Venturi mask is not without problems and controversy. Despite doctors and respiratory therapists liking to believe that it can deliver a precisely specified oxygen concentration, as the dial suggests, there are a number of reasons it is not precise. And there is even some debate in the literature as to whether the Bernoulli equation and Venturi effect offer the best descriptions of how the Venturi mask actually works. However, I've included it here because it's certainly widely believed to be an example of the Venturi effect in action. Next, let's look at my personal favorite application of Bernoulli, which is in the field of cardiology. We'll start with a schematic of the right side of the heart with our right atrium and right ventricle, separated by the tricuspid valve. Now in most people, even in completely healthy people, there's some amount of blood, typically very small, that travels backwards through the tricuspid valve, moving from the right ventricle to the right atrium during systole. Normally during systole, blood travels from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery and onto the lungs, and we like to think that there's nothing going backwards, but a tiny amount does even in normal people. This is called tricuspid regurgitation, and measuring the velocity of this regurgitant jet provides important insight into hemodynamics with the help of Bernoulli. To measure this velocity, we put an ultrasound probe against the skin of a patient's chest wall, and it fires sound waves into the body. Each time the sound wave encounters a different structure, some fraction of that wave gets reflected back. If the reflected wave has a different frequency than the wave released by the probe, it means that something is either moving away or towards the probe. This is an example of the Doppler effect, which will not be our focus here, but the important point is that this velocity can be measured accurately. But what do we do with it? Let's write out Bernoulli with a point in the center of the right ventricle, or RV, as point 1, and a point just adjacent to the valve within the right atrium, or RA, as point 2. First, the difference in the vertical height between these two chambers relative to the other pressures involved is trivial, so the rho g y terms can be ignored. Let's rearrange terms. 
Since point RA is adjacent to the tricuspid valve and point RV is some distance away from the valve, then the velocity RA is much greater than velocity RV, even more so when these velocities are squared. So the term one half density VRV squared can be ignored to achieve an approximation. This leaves uh, pressure RV minus pressure RA is approximately equal to one half density times VRA squared. At this point, let's use a number of relationships that we know. First, pressure is measured in pascals, which is newtons per meter squared. Density is in kilograms per cubic meter and velocity in meters per second. One millimeter of mercury is equal to 133.3 pascals and the density of blood is normally about 1060 kilograms per meters cubed. So if we incorporate this information, we find that pressure RV in millimeters of mercury minus pressure RA in millimeters of mercury approximately equals this times VRA in meters per second squared, which becomes the pressure gradient across the tricuspid valve during systole in millimeters of mercury is approximately equal to four times the velocity of the tricuspid regurge jet squared. This extremely parsed down version of Bernoulli is sometimes referred to as the simplified Bernoulli equation. So why is it so special? If you remember from lesson four, you know that we can use the concept of hydrostatic pressure to estimate a person's central venous pressure from the height of jugular venous distension. And central venous pressure is equal to right atrial pressure. So adding the central venous pressure to the tricuspid valve pressure gradient gives us a uh, estimate of right ventricular systolic pressure, which in the absence of pulmonic valve disease is equal to the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. In other words, combining hydrostatics and Bernoulli allows us to non-invasively estimate the blood pressures within a patient's pulmonary artery, which gives us insight into a hugely diverse collection of cardiac and pulmonary diseases. Let's take a quick look at how this might be used in real life. Given the following physical exam and echocardiographic findings, what is the approximate value of the patient's pulmonary artery systolic pressure, frequently abbreviated PASP? So here's our patient and his internal jugular vein, and we observe that his jugular venous pressure, that is the maximum vertical height at which pulsations are still visible in the vein, is 10 centimeters above the sternal angle, which is elevated. And we get a simultaneous echocardiogram. Here is what's called the parasternal short axis view, from which we can measure the velocity of the tricuspid regurge jet, um, which we have here at three meters per second. Step one, the central venous pressure or CVP in centimeters of water is equal to the height of the JVP above the sternal angle plus five. So CVP is 15 centimeters of water. You may remember from an earlier video that one centimeter of water as a unit of pressure is equal to 0 0.74 millimeters of mercury. So CVP is 11 millimeters of mercury. Next, we take the simplified Bernoulli equation the pressure gradient across the tricuspid valve is equal to four times the velocity in meters per second squared. So this pressure gradient is therefore 36 millimeters of mercury. In the absence of pulmonic valve stenosis, which is very rare, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is approximately equal to the tricuspid pressure gradient plus the CVP, which is 47 millimeters of mercury. Normal is under 30. So this patient has what is known as pulmonary hypertension or elevated blood pressures in the lungs. Lest you think that what we did here is just an academic exercise, I actually do this calculation all the time for real patients in the hospital, and understanding it is relatively important in the practice of internal medicine. The next lesson will discuss how to apply the concepts behind Ohm's law from electricity and magnetism to fluid mechanics, focusing on hemodynamics in the body.